All right, and we can get started here. Um, I will upload last week's um, Zoom session because I know some of you had to, to walk out um, for athletics early, I, and I, that you know it's just part of the the process. Um, I just before I did that, um, I was requested to not uh, share that uh, video more widely. Um, uh, and, and so I wanted to just kind of make everyone aware of that when I put that up there, not to, to share that link with, with other people. Um, so uh, I will put that, that up and, and make that available for, for everyone to participate in and uh, catch up. So uh, those of you left early, you missed um, taxes and then a second uh, speaker um, who was the co-founder of the company that uh, I worked on during my sabbatical. Uh, and if, if you were paying attention on Slack, you noticed that he's been added to Slack as well. So if you want to catch up with him, you can do that. All right. Uh, other, um, you guys are giggling like I don't know what's going on. Um, so, uh, uh, so um, you hopefully saw in Slack the, the announcement that I made about the mini retreat. Um, that will be on October 17th. So that's uh, two weeks from, from this Saturday. Uh, again, I don't know if any of you athletes have special um, Games on, on that day, please let me know if you do. Um, otherwise, I'm expecting all of you to be there. Um, we've talked since the beginning of class that this is your chance to do your senior advice for the freshmen. So, uh, as a class cohort as a whole, you need to kind of make sure that gets organized and taken care of by that date. I'm not going to um, kind of um, keep nagging you about that. Um, you need to figure out how you're going to organize that, what you're going to do, how you're going to um, set, set that up. My thinking is that the time together will be um, kind of three parts. Uh, the first part is going to be just a, a general a worship time for anyone in the department, okay? Um, and I um, think Tessa D'Souza is organizing that. So she's contacted you about potentially um, playing an instrument or, or singing, uh, that's that's what that is. And so that will be say from one to, to two-ish. Um, then we're going to break out into the senior advice session. So the juniors and the sophomores um, we'll, we'll leave at that point um, and we'll have a, a advice session. Um, I would plan on 90, that's 90, 90 minutes for, for that session. That's typically how long it takes um, in, in the past. And so if you can kind of think about as you're planning, that's how much time we're going to allocate for this particular activity. That will kind of help you have a better idea of what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, who's going to talk for how long, however you want to plan it. Um, and then uh, after that, it'll just kind of be a um, hangout for as long as you want to just um, play games, talk, chill, whatever, and uh, no real expectation about what falls out or how long after that that you, you need or that I'm sort of expecting you to, to stay. So kind of letting it be organic and how, however long or short that is. So you know, so one to four-ish is kind of in my mind what, what that's going to look like. So definitely not a overnight thing by, by any means, but hopefully allows you to at least introduce yourselves to the freshmen. And I know you're not going to have the same sort of connection with the freshmen 
as the sophomores or juniors. Um, but at least can can give them some of the advice that maybe the sophomores and the juniors haven't quite um, figured everything out yet. The last thing I'll say about that, and I do mean last thing, uh, is I have continued to upload to your assignment that had all the questions from the students, the 2019 questions and the 2020 questions. I've continued to add to the 2020 <laughs> questions. So each week as a freshman have added more questions um, and submitted them to me, I've continued to just add, um, append those to, to the end of the list of questions. So you can use that to kind of get a gauge for what the freshmen are, are thinking presently and kind of what state of mind they're in right now, if that will help you in, in planning for the um, year. Questions that you guys have for me? Are you going to email out those details or is it all going to be on Slack? Um, I, uh, I will probably just leave them on Slack. Yeah. Yeah. All right then. Um, so today, what I want to do is spend some time kind of just talking about um, what you've read so far in the textbook, uh, or I don't even want to call it a textbook, right? Because that's not really what it is. Um, in the assigned reading, I love that. The assigned reading for our class. Um, I've read your your summaries for the first two chapters. Uh, hopefully, you've seen that I've done that. But since the next two summaries were due ten minutes ago. I haven't had a chance to look into your, your feedback for, for them. Um, uh, it seemed like most of you were um, getting things out of these the, the first two chapters. Hopefully that's continued in the, the, the next two chapters. Uh, so um, let's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let's uh, maybe before I do any sort of uh, guided uh, discussion, I'd like to hear um, things that you particularly um, uh, appreciated as you were as you've been reading so far in in the book so far. What things have you liked that, that you you read about the text? Yeah, uh, I think it was nice, it's nice to see some examples. Like I felt like they provided a lot of examples within uh, each of the points they're trying to make to provide a real life scenario where their their points would be used and needed. Okay, so you just appreciated that it wasn't just some ideas, but they made it more concrete by including mm -hmm. examples from real life. What else? Yes. I really liked, I think it was in chapter four where she was kind of went into like decision making and how Sometimes we might have multiple good things to choose from, and she kind of took away some of the stress, like, well, I have to do exactly the right thing. Mm. That, that you don't have to make that right choice, and if you haven't, you've made a wrong choice, choosing between multiple good choice mm -hmm. options. Yeah. Uh, I found just the uh, comprehensive nature of the content that it is going over to the really interesting uh, to the point where uh, she's kind of even talked about some things that I haven't even realized that I'm currently uh, I guess exploring or uh, especially with the uh, decision making aspect uh -huh. going forward from here um, she kind of commented on some things that I hadn't really uh, even noticed uh, that were kind of that were prevalent in my so she kind of helped peel back the the covers to your own internal processing. Cool. Yeah. 
I like when it says, um, when it comes to discerning God's will, sometimes we overcomplicate it. Some of us become so consumed by wanting to make the best right choice that we agonize over every major life decision. Uh, talking about how we view it as part of practice, we're trying to hit the bullseye, otherwise we'll have something less than that and we're not okay at that. And so I've, I've noticed that in myself as I'm thinking about options for next year and trying to think, okay, this option is good, but this option is maybe a better or I'm gonna the best one. But when we're talking to someone else who has this choosing between like two options, it's like really easy for us to make that decision for them. Oh, that one sounds better, you should just do that. But when it comes to our own decision, we have so much more emotional stock in it that we it's hard for us to make that decision. So it's just interesting how much the how much we agonize over the process when it's our own decision versus someone else's. Mm -hmm. Even though like someone else that I know is considering two options, it's like, oh I could see you really enjoying that one. You do that. You're like, that's it. You know? So I think that's that's really he probably had good answers. I did appreciate how in chapter three she made it very clear that adversity is a part of life, as much as we are often trained to think that it isn't. That that what's a part of life? Adversity. Adversity, right? That uh, yeah. In fact, it's kind of normal, right? I don't want to get pain. I don't want to deal with that. <clears throat> does does this year make that easier or harder to accept? Because it feels like it's been one long year of adversity in a certain sense. Right? You're constantly fighting against uh, what, whatever the current crisis is, right? Does that make it easier or harder to accept the, the, that idea? I think easier, because it's like, I don't know, it seems unreal that like a year ago everything was normal, and it feels like this year has been so long, but at the same time, like, we're still here, and we're like, not doing that badly, like, we're holding it together somehow, so I think that's, it's easier to be like, oh, I'm literally living through a pandemic right now, and I'm still okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I think also, uh, kind of the same, I think it, it definitely makes it easier um, because, you know, in this season of life, I feel like it's it's very easy to uh, feel like unsure uh, of where you're going next. And then once you realize uh, life is just a lot of, um, I, guess, I guess, just like uncertainty put together. And then, so, you know, in the midst of this whole pandemic crisis, um, this is something that you know the entire world hasn't really gone through before, and so this is all uh, new for everyone. And so it's just encouraging that um, I guess like everyone's everyone's going through uh, uncomfortable situations, and everyone's always uh, learning. And uh, um, so it's it's kind of encouraging, I guess, to to know that you're not alone feeling like you're mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. That this kind of being reaffirmed and sure as I read is like recently I've been trying to figure out like what would be the best option for next year. And I think I want to prioritize community above most other things. Mm -hmm. Like if higher paid job but in a place where I'm alone, I would choose that second over being in a place where I know people or I know I'll have people access or access to people that would be good for my community. Mm -hmm. How many people resonate with what, what Jacob said? I'm going to target a location first, and that's going to be a more of a primary decision maker, and then look at for job opportunities that that match that that particular location or, or set of location. Okay, more more than half of you. Some of you, not sure.
what else did you appreciate as you were reading through this? Yeah. I think a key theme that you can kind of see through these, both these chapters is that God is in control and that like even when we go through these like trials and tribulations or we have to make these like super tough decisions, it's super easy to like fall into periods of like major anxiety as you have to deal with these different things. But it's just helpful and reassuring knowing that in the end, like God is in control mm-hmm. and that um, he's going to open doors when he wants to and you'll find those doors. And so really just in the end, like it's, it's not really up to us to like to make the right decision or to get through that trial and tribulation. Instead, it's up to us to, just to trust in God that He's going to put us where He wants to in the end. And that's just something that's been reassuring to me. Is like mm-hmm. I'm trying to find a job or look for different areas, and it's like doors are closing and other doors are opening, and it's just kind of confusing and and, mm-hmm. and, and anxious at times. But it's just helpful to remember that in the end, God's going to put me where God wants me. Yeah, just kind of related. I think I appreciate that he doesn't only include examples of difficulties, but also some of how people, uh, how people overcame, overcame that difficulty. Yeah. And I think it's encouraging that, um, like after the difficulties, we it produces something and mm. like perseverance or characters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it gives it a little bit more purpose than, than just pain for the sake of pain. Um, hopefully, the, I don't know if you guys remember the first exercise we did in class, right? Where I had you fold the paper into quarters. Right, and ask you know what you're excited about this year, what you're excited about after graduation, what you're worried about this year, and what you're worried about after graduation. Part of that was inspired by just as I was reading this book and thinking about these kind of um, mentalities that that she highlights in here about how there's a lot of anxiety, how there's a lot of worry, this uncertainty. That, that you're talking about. And just wanting to give you an opportunity to be able to explicitly list those things and not kind of have them sit kind of implicitly under the surface, but try to call them to, to visibility within yourself that you're able to say and identify, yes, this is where I'm worried. This is where anxiety is. This is what I'm excited for. Oh, I'm, I am more focused on the future and I'm not thinking about the, the present, right? That was a big part of, of chapter two, right? Is, is being present in the moment and finishing well and not so focusing on what's going to happen next that we kind of lose out on the, this uh, year of, of, of finishing well and so forth, right? So that was that, so I hope that by doing that, that's, that has made that more visible to yourself. And it's, and then as you've been reading these chapters, you've been able to think about those things that you wrote down um, and, and say, oh yeah, that's how I'm feeling. Oh yeah, that's what I'm doing. This is what, um, I, I resonate with this this character, well not character, this, this example in, or um, that makes sense to me, even if I didn't do that or I wouldn't do that. I could see how it might be tempting to do that, or it might be um, frustrating to, to do those things. Um, <clears throat> what parts of the um, reading um, fell a little flat for you? Felt like, yeah, it doesn't quite match me so well. I don't, I don't quite get that. The yeah. community part for me, where I talked about sharing troubles with the community, because uh-huh. I tend to keep a small group of people uh-huh. close. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I guess I'm kind of a private person. I don't like a lot of people knowing my business. So uh-huh. in that aspect, 
thinking about having to share my personal with like a whole church or um, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> so it, you you'd want to build up that that you. It's not the idea of the community that it's the size of the community that she kind of. Right. right. And you and like to have that small group that you do share. That I those trust areas. and that I can depend on, that I know I can depend on that kind of thing. Versus just having a large amount of people that I might not know as well. Yeah, it's hard to, to it's it's scary to think about being vulnerable with with people you don't know. I see the benefits of it, but for me personally, that's yeah. not much of Uh-huh, uh-huh. I just remember from last week's reading the part about like in transition it kind of fell flat for me at first where it's like, oh, we're staying in transition, it's tough in medical. And so I was saying, like, this is what I was told when I went to middle school and high school and college, and now I'm leaving college in a year. It's like, I've been told this my whole life, and it's never been that big a deal. But for some people, it is. Mm. And that was a different mm. Mm. Hopefully that means that this book is more resonating with you than not resonating with you if you're not able to come up with a, a, a lot of um, things uh, that kind of fell flat, which hopefully is good. Um, um, I want to camp up a little bit on, on the idea in, in chapter four, this idea of making God honoring uh, decisions. Um, and maybe maybe pulling out a paper and pen would be, a, or paper and pencil now would be, would be a, a good idea. Because what I'd like you to do, um, yeah, yeah, you don't have time, yeah, the transit. Um, what I'd like you to do as you're pulling out uh, paper and pen uh, or writing this in your laptop or whatever makes the most sense is um, I'd like you to try to describe, like if you were to describe me, if you were to write this out and hand this in, um, what like in one or two sentences, when someone says, um, uh, listening for the voice of God or hearing the voice of God, what is that? What do you think that means? What, or, yeah, generally. And then follow that up immediately after with like, what does that mean for you specifically? When, when you say, I'm hearing the voice of God, or I want to hear the voice of God, what, what are your expectations for, for that to take place? So first, when people in general say, I'm listening for the voice of God, or I'm hearing the voice of God, what do you think they mean? And then for you specifically, when you, if you were to say, I'm, I want to hear the voice of God, or I feel like I heard God saying this to me, what does, what would that mean for you? What would that look like? What, how would you be experiencing that?
then maybe a third follow-up question to that is, given what you said it means for you to hear the voice of God or sort of seeking to hear the voice of God, have you ever felt like you've experienced what you just wrote? And can you give an example of the time So I guess I'm asking, is this a theoretical question or is it more of a one that you've already experienced? Shouldn't run out of time. I am signing in from an edu, but Taylor.edu address. So we've purchased an uh, enterprise license, so it shouldn't allow us to be on four years. Um, I think I could go several ways here, but I think I'm going to start by opening up um, the floor to you to ask questions along these lines of me. Uh, if there are specific questions that by me asking this uh, or you writing about it and thinking about it have prompted you or the reading that you've done, that you have specific questions that based on my life experience uh, or talking with other people that I can mm, clarify or give uh, a different example about that would be helpful for you. So I'll, so I'll start there. The questions that you guys would like me to answer specifically when it comes to hearing Voice. Yeah. So what does it mean for you to hear that voice? Okay. Um, so for me, I, I think it's a really hard thing to explain. I hope that it was hard in a good way for, for you to try to write something down. But not because I don't think I know what it means, but I don't think I have good words to, to put to it. So let me try the best I can. Uh, but if I stumble, um, ask clarifying questions, or if it's confusing, let me know. Um, uh, I do think that God speaks audibly to some people and they do really feel like they hear a vocalization of God on their heart or maybe even on their, their ears. But I haven't personally experienced that way of God speaking to, to me. Um, I have though felt 
many times, and I guess I'd maybe say like an impression or uh, a sense that doesn't seem to have come from my normal inner voice. Um, which uh, I should just say real quick, I just learned this this spring that some people do not have an inner monologue, um, which is really strange to people who do have an inner monologue. But so I do have an inner monologue and I have a voice that I talk to myself with. And that's not what I'm talking about. It feels like it's coming not from myself internally. It feels um, it feels other than that. I don't know better how to describe it because and but it's important for me that it doesn't feel like it's from myself because if it did then I would have I guess a lot more uncertainty in some sense of like is this a is this a good idea or not and in other senses I have a lot more certainty like like when I want to make a decision, when I've decided to make a decision, I'm like, this is what it's going to be, and uh, I'm done thinking about it, right? And so when, if it feels like it's coming from me, if it's like, you need to make this decision, okay, I'm done. Uh, but if it feels like it's coming from outside of myself, then it makes me have to think about and process internally about, okay, well, why why do I have this um, impression about what I should be doing or what decision I should be making and so forth? Um, sometimes that can be very simple things like, hey, you need to go up to this person that you're um, you know, standing in line with and, and uh, befriend them or, or say something kind or, or welcoming to them, you know, and, and it seems kind of strange to hear. Why would I talk to a stranger? That's definitely not me. Um, and, um, uh, and sometimes for me, more frequently, it happens um, during prayer. More frequently, it's when I'm already in the mode of communicating, trying to communicate with God and, and being very explicit about saying, God, speak to me. I, um, I want to hear from you what is um, what you have for me. And less frequently when I'm just kind of going about my day and doing my own thing. I think part of that is because maybe like many of you, a lot of my day has a lot of um, cacophony in it. There's a lot of noise, either literally or um, metaphorically going on in my life that I can't hear what else is going on. There just isn't, I'm in a rush. I'm I'm focused on whatever needs to be done in that moment, um, and I've, I've kind of closed my ears and and heart to to anything else because I'm so focused on whatever that activity is that I'm, I'm doing. But when I stop and sit and quiet myself down it's easier for me to, to hear God's voice uh, than at other times. Um, for me, like I said, it's often like an impression, a sense of Feeling, but sometimes it can be like a, a vital passage or a biblical character or um, 
being reminded of a uh, a sermon or a, a chapel that I attended. Um, and um, oftentimes then I, <laughs> I have to sit and say, well, why is that important? Why is that relevant to, to me now? And you, you know, I have to, because it's not always obvious to me what, what that means. Um, so that's the most literal for me, feeling like I hear God's voice. But I think oftentimes um, when I talk about what God, how God is or has, directed me in the past. It hasn't always been because I've heard or felt this impression that I'm referring to. It can be uh, through um, through the words of other believers, repeated not just because I, I like what this person said to me, but because I hear this person say it and this person